Uh, thank all of you for staying uh, so late. We're running late, I apologize. Um, this is a 30 minute talk, but I will try to move faster than usual. So hopefully we'll finish a little earlier. And sorry about that. Okay, so basically I'm going to talk about infringement syndromes in the ankle. And you can think about a few impingements, anterolateral, anterior, anteromedial, I'm going to cover most of them. And then once I finish with ankle impingement, I'm going to talk about what we, talk, what we call extra articular impingements, and that's the pale calcaneal and calcaneal fibular uh, impingement. So um, they are usually, most ankle impingements are related to ankle trauma, usually sprains. They can be good due to any, any cause of bone or soft tissue friction, and they are often associated with altered biomechanics. The treatment is usually conservative, at least initially, and then surgical removal of the impingement agent is resorted to if this does not succeed. So when we look at uh, impingements, and especially if we look at x-rays, the ones that we actually see are the anterior bone, bony and soft tissue impingements. We can actually also see anteromedial impingements. So these often occur together. They can be either bony, which you can see on x-rays, or soft tissue. And then you can have the anterolateral impingement, which is usually soft tissue. And then you can have the much less common posteromedial soft tissue impingement and posterior bony impingement, which sometimes we can see on x-rays. So we can see these uh, three, the an anterior, anteromedial, and posterior bony impingement on radiographs. The rest we really need MRI or ultrasound to assess them. Anterior ankle impingement on radiographs is manifested by anterior osteophytes originating from the tibia and the uh, talus. Most of these are intercapsular, although uh, they have been shown to also be some that are extracapsular. And here we see an example of it. This is a typical example. We see osteophytosis arising from the anterior tibia and uh, the opposing osteophyte from the talus. Etiology can be either direct trauma, repetitive, or acute ankle dorsiflexion. You can also have plantar flexion. Uh, which results in osteophytosis or spurring that are related to capsular traction. So these ones are not necessarily intrinsic. We can see it in many um, um, athletes, such as runners, soccer, uh, ballet players, gymnasts, and high jumpers. And basically what we know that these patients present with is painful limitation of dorsiflexion. They may present with catching, swelling, and they basically have a decreased angle of, um, of dorsiflexion. Now it's interesting, I was just talking to one of the orthopedic surgeons here, and he said that at least when they do arthroscopy and they dorsiflex the foot, they don't really see them impinging on one another these osteophytes. So um, the etiology for the pain here or for those opposing osteophytes, I don't think is necessarily clear um, uh, yet. Anyway, treatment is orthotics, non-steroidal and uh, anti-inflammatory medication. You can do phys physical therapy or steroids. And if that doesn't occur, uh, you can do the bereavement, arthroscopic bereavement of these osteophytes. And if we are to grade it, we can grade it into grade one, which is just synovial impingement with tiny little tibial spurs. Grade two, you have larger tibial spurs, greater than three millimeters. And grade three is when you have both tibial and tail spurs with or without fragmentation. And grade four is the final finding of osteoarthritis. Keep in mind that a lot of times when we see the anterior impingement, it actually is better seen on ankle oblique images or sometimes even on foot <coughs> radiographs. And you can see that it's much more medially located than your anterior located osteophytosis. Often, I find that we also get posterior oste osteophytes and posterior impingement 
at the same time as we have the anterior impingement. So what should we be looking for in MRI? We may see the same thing as on radiographs. We may see the osteophytes here as the little tibial osteophyte. We may see the tailor osteophytes. Often they're not in the same plane when we look at them on our sequential thermographic images. But aside from the bony changes, we can also see synovitis and soft tissue entrapment. We can see cartilage lesions, intratipular bodies, and eventually osteophytes. And notice here that we also have anterior as well as posterior osteophytosis. Now this is interesting. A lot of times what you get is, we call it the divot sign, and this has actually been described in the arthroscopy literature. And basically what it is, it's a tailor defect which accommodates the tibial osteophyte. Now again, that doesn't go along with what uh, my orthopedic friend told me today, that they don't necessarily uh, oppose each other. But nevertheless, this is described in the literature. And this is something that we not infrequently see on MR. Patients can have pain from the bones rubbing against each other or from capsular distension as we see here, synovitis, you see a little bit of the thickening here, as well as the um, you know, secondary marrow edema as we see here. Sometimes we just see these low signal intensity structure, which I believe reflect scarring and synovitis. And as I said, you can get osteoarthritis and you can get what has been described as the trap track sign, which is cartilaginous defects involving the tailor, Articular surface, sometimes you'll get more severe osteoarthritis as we see here with those cartilage. <coughs> as I said before, you can see it on the weak images as we see here, and here you see it on CT, you see those opposing osteophytes, and you see it on um, axial images with this tibial osteophyte. Moving, more, moving away from the uh, anterior anterior medial impingement, we can go to the anterolateral impingement. Now that is only a soft tissue impingement, as I said before, so usually you won't see it, and it is secondary to ankle sprains, and basically you get synovial thickening and scarring either of the syndesmotic ligaments, as we see here, or of the collateral ligaments, as we see here, and you can get this synovial proliferation right in this area. Again, you can see the athletes, especially dancers, uh, and soccer players has been described. Patients complain of pain and locking in dors in, uh, with dorsiflexion and squatting, and it's not surprising, right? You have the soft tissue structure, and it can herniate into the lateral gutter, herniates in and out, and prevents from full dorsiflexion and causes pain. So what we see on MR is low signal in the lateral gutter, um, and it should be distinguished from the ligaments. So here we have the normal ligament here. This is the anterior tibial fibular ligament. And here you have a very beautiful example of anterolateral impingement. This is an old case, but nevertheless, it has that meniscoid shape. And initially in the early orthopedic literature, they described this as a meniscoid lesion. And you can see how in dorsiflexion, this can go in and out of the joint and off the, in and out of the lateral gutter and can force impingement. So here's an example of a 33-year-old basketball player with pain and locking and dorsiflexion. And we see the soft tissue density here. And on fluid sensitive images, you see that it remains stark, consistent with scarring and synovitis. And as I said, this can impinge in and out of the lateral gutter and reduce difficulty with squatting, difficulty with dorsiflexion. You can often see it on sagittal images. This would be the tibial fibular region and this would be the talofibular region and in between them you see the scar tissue and um, soft tissue density. Again now normal, this is a little bit lower down, this is talofibular ligament and posterior talofibular ligament, you see joint fluid going into extending up to it is a part of the capsule. And when you get anterolateral soft tissue impingement, you see these soft tissue densities going into the lateral gutter. 
Now, just one word of warning, which I should have said in the beginning of this talk. We talk about impingement, but we also always emphasize everywhere in the joint, everywhere in the body, that impingement actually is a clinical diagnosis. So whenever I dictate something like that, if I was to see this, I would say that there is uh, soft tissue proliferation, you know, possibly synovitis and scarring, which may reflect anterolateral impingement in the appropriate clinical setting. Because these are not, as we know in the shoulder, they don't always cause impingement. This is higher up, and we see the scarring, we see this minor ligamentous region. And more of the same, we see the scarring here, and this is, again, soft tissue density that kind of forms this meniscoid area. Notice that the marker is right in that area. And finally, it can also have ossification. When it has ossification, uh, we actually can see it on soft in, on radiographs, but most of this is actually a soft tissue impingement. Talking about posterior impingement, posterior impingement can be either osseous or soft tissue. Most of you are familiar with the Osteoidomic syndrome. People have also called it Taylor compression syndrome. And this is due to pain posteriorly exacerbated by forced plant deflection. So you can see that with the common in basketball players, in um, uh, ballet dancers, with push off maneuvers. Maybe related to either direct trauma, but most of the time it's due to repetitive plant deflection and entrapment of the bones and the soft tissues in that area. So we may see it with osseous structures such as an elongated steater process, as we see here. You may see it with osteogonum that I mentioned here, or you can just have all kinds of little clefts here arising between the calcaneus that can impinge on the tail, and I'll show you examples of that. It may also be related to osteophytis, right? I show you these opposing osteophytes coming from the posterior tibia. One of the one of the causes for it is actually a posterior malleolar fracture. So when a posterior malleolar fracture heals, it often is a little bit minimally displaced and then it can cover, cause more coverage of that talus and secondary impingement. Here is an example of an elongated state of process and there is a pseudo cleft formed by the calcaneus, I don't know which was the chicken or the egg, but nevertheless, you can see the cozy marrow edema here and the bony as well as soft tissue changes compatible with impingement. When we look at the soft tissue impingement, you can think about posterior capsular thickening, flexibilis longus tenosynovitis, or thickening of the intermalleolar ligament. And here we have an example. This is a 16-year-old basketball player with pain and tenderness in the posterior ankle. We see here an ostrigonum, right? We're very familiar with that. We also see the edema, right? It has low signal in it on, the, on our T1-weighted images. And then on T2-weighted images, you see here increased uh, marrow edema, right? Also an opposing talus. But notice also that you see soft tissue entrapment. So it's not just bony entrapment, it's also soft tissue entrapment. And this is the axial image on this patient, the same thing. This is another patient. This was a young ballet dancer, 14-year-old. This is an old case, but a touch of prison case, that I always show it. You see a lot of edema in the astrigonum, edema in the opposing talus, in the sympandrosis, flexahalysis, longus tenosynovitis, but also a lot of soft tissue edema. And this is a different patient, kind of a fragmented astrigonum. And then we see here the flexahalysis longus, and there is this low signal intensity structure around it. Now you have to be careful, is it muscle, right? The flexahalysis has muscle going down here, but this actually is not muscle. It doesn't really look like it has a normal striation of muscle. And this turned out to be flexahalysis stenosing tenosynovitis with a lot of scarring surrounding <coughs> that flexahalysis longus tendon associated with osteoarthritis syndrome. Now this is a little bit different. This is soft tissue. This is 48-year-old female with posterior pain slots, post-ligamentous injury. And notice the marked thickening of the ligaments here, 
right? These are the syntesmatic ligaments. These are the collateral ligaments posteriorly. And there's a lot of thickening there of the ligaments. Some recesses, and large recesses of the joint. Um, and again, this is not something we can be sure it is impingement, but we can tell the clinician these findings are compatible with impingement syndrome in their COVID clinical setting. This is a ballet dancer, tiny little ostrigona, but she still has a lot of soft tissue entrapment right here. And a lot of edema here. Notice that this is not within recesses. This is just within the fat, within cadus fat fat, and this is compatible with impingement in posterior impingement in their COVID clinical setting. Now, most, some of you have heard about the intermalleolar ligament. This is also called the tibial slit of the posterior tail of pivotal ligament. And occasionally, it can be thickened. As we see here, it's actually quite thickened and can cause posterior impingement. Uh, sorry, I went backwards for a second. Okay. Now let's talk about soft tissue posteromedial and antromedial impingement. This has been reported mainly in the orthopedic literature. It's the least recognized and it's probably the least common. And it's often related to deltoid injury. So you get deltoid fibrosis here and then you get capsule synovitis and thickening, which can actually displace the posterior tibial tendon as well as the flexor tissue bone. Here is an example. This is the posterior tibial tendon. And here is where the deltoid ligament should be. We actually are seeing the superficial deltoid here. This is the deep deltoid. And we just see this glob here that extends posteriorly. So a lot of times you can have it anteriorly as well as posteriorly. It's abutting the flexor tutorial globus. And we see here a lot of scarring and uh, synovitis within the medial gutter. Another patient where the tibiotalar component of the deltoid should be, we see this ugly looking scar tissue, there is loss of the normal striation, there is displacement of the superficial deltoid by the thickened scarred deep deltoid. This is the tibiotalar component of the deltoid. We see all the scarring here and we also see a lot of ossification here. So this is anteromedial as well as posteromedial impingement in a 51-year-old uh, male. And as I said, I often see it extending from anterior to posterior. And this, I believe, may be the last case I'm showing you here. Medium malleolus, posterior tibial tendon, and there is all the scarring here in the deep tibial component of the deltoid with uh, impingement. Now, going to flat foot related impingement, this is what I mentioned before as extraarticular impingement. This is impingement below the ankle joint, that's why we call it extraarticular, and it is usually associated with severe flat foot deformity. Patients present with lateral pain, um, especially during weight bearing. This is, um, can be in the talocalcaneal, usually related to sinus tarsi impingement, can be uh, can manifest as edema in the tail of the male bones, the opposing bony surfaces, or can be subfibular, which is calcaneal fibular. Basically, the fibula becomes weight-bearing, and I'll show you exactly what happens in a second. So the imaging findings, depending how severe it is, you can have either tail calcaneal cyst formation, sclerosis, you can see soft tissue changes in the sinus tarsi. You really see kind of loss of the fat within the sinus tarsi and loss of the space within the sinus tarsi. Eventually, when it becomes quite severe, you get the calcaneal fibular, and the final stage of it is perineal tendon subluxation and dislocation. So let's look at what happens. You know, you have flat foot deformity, and you start developing this hind foot valgus. The talus now impinges on the calcaneus. The calcaneus actually starts slipping laterally and eventually is going to become weight-bearing with the fibula. So this fibula is not supposed to weight-bear, right? But once you have this severe hind foot valgus, 
you get calcaneal fibrillar impingement, you get entrapment of all the soft tissues here. And interestingly, that explains also why with flat foot deformity, you can develop an increased incidence of stress fractures in the fibula because the fibula becomes weight bearing. And a different way to look at it is here is your lateral space between the talus and the calcaneus. With flat foot deformity, you get stretching of the structures here, the medial anella, at, at the deltoid, the uh, sprain ligament, the posterior tibial tendon, and then it gets impinged laterally, and you get the sinus palsy impingement as well as tail calcaneal impingement. Here is an example of it. Here is the downward sloping of the talus, compatible with flat foot deformity and midfoot sag, and that lateral space between the tails and calcaneus is markedly encroached upon. And here we see on axial images, there is uncovering of that talus, lateral subluxation of the navicular, <coughs> and impingement on that tail or calcaneal space with a lot of scarring in that area. On sagittal images, you see often the opposing changes in the bones at the lateral Taylor process and the critical angle of the sun, the calcaneus. We see here edema, we see subchondral cystic changes in that area. And looking at it clinically, what these patients eventually develop is subfibular impingement. <coughs> so initially they have pain. When you have posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or when you have flat foot deformity, <coughs> you have medial pain right here due to that talus and pronation and due to the shoes rubbing on that posterior tibial tendon and on the bones, obviously due to the tenosynovitis of the posterior tibial tendon, but eventually the pain will move laterally because of all that extra articular impingement. And here as you see, now the calcaneus is impinging on the fibula, you get these little pseudo facets as we see here. The space between the talus and calcaneus becomes decreased. I'll show you that actually better here, for example. You can see that the calcaneus actually slips away from the talus and you get this calcaneal fibular impingement. Notice, by the way, that there is marrow edema in the fibula. And notice something else. The, the marker is lateral position. The patient actually has posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, but the marker is lateral because that's where they have the patient. Okay, and this was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and posterior tibial tendon disruption. Here is again that calcaneus slipping away from the talus and impinging on all these space here. And now you're seeing the entrapment of the soft tissue. And what soft tissues exist there? You have two main structures. You have the calcaneal fibular ligament. So you'll get more thickening of the calcaneal fibular ligament, obliteration of the fat, and the last thing that sits here are the peroneal tendons. So you can see why they could end up subluxing laterally and developing uh, tears. And here is another patient. We see here again edema in the fibula. We see marker lateral position. We see entrapment of the soft tissues here. This is where the calcaneal fibula should be. And Another patient, actually they all look the same. You get this hind foot valgus, edema in the fibula, and in this particular patient, we also see the peroneal tendon dislocation. More of the same. I just love this topic, so I'm going show you a lot of cases of that. Again, you see the peroneal tendon dislocation. The, this is the final outcome. You usually don't see that. So in conclusion, impingement in the ankle can either be uh, bony or soft tissue. The bony we can easily pick up on radiographs. The MRI or ultrasound, which I haven't spoken about, are more useful for visualizing the soft tissue abnormalities that are associated with it. A lot of times they occur together. Remember that when we dictate, we need to say that this is appropriate with impingement syndrome. If this is consistent with it. Uh, impingement syndrome in the appropriate clinical setting because we really don't know if these patients are symptomatic or not. So thank you very much. This actually will conclude this portion of the um, of the conference, the MSK portion.
know that the moderator unfortunately had to be. So thank you very much for staying so late. I hope you had a good time.